So here is our schedule and we're coming right here to software testing. And let's start right off at motivation. And can someone add the section headings in HackMD? So what's the basic idea behind all this testing stuff? Like, when you hear testing, what do you think? I hear exam. No, I'm kidding. Um... <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I hear in, ge in general, like being sure that the functionality you try to decode is there yeah, and is doing what it's supposed to. That's actually, yeah, that's better than what I would have said. So the oh. functionality you expect to be there is actually there. And what if it's not? Well, there's this metaphor here. So in a past life, I studied chemistry and there, whenever you would use some sort of analytical machine, always the first part of our experiment was making sure the instruments or whatever we had was working correctly. And here we are in with code. So you would think, okay, the code always does what it's told to do, but what if it's told to do something wrong? So testing is designed to check us. Mm. Let's look at a really quick example here. So testing in a nutshell. So we have a function here called Fahrenheit to Celsius. And it, well, it does what it says. So it converts between the two temperature units. So I write this function and then I want to test it. So how do we test it? We just insert a couple of parameters, at least in this case, yeah. in the function and mesh them with the expected parameter. Yeah. So we basically, like in this case, we basically give it some input and see if the right output comes out. Which really, I mean, if you're doing this yourself and you're making a new function for Fahrenheit to Celsius, do you sit down and do you like write on some paper and say, okay, does it seem like it works? Or do you write it and then you plug in zero and, or what's it in Fahrenheit, 32 and 212 and see if it comes out like you expect? Um, well, I think it, it depends what's yeah. your knowledge <laughs> prior to that, right? <laughs> you know that 100 Fahrenheit, but another way of testing it in this case would be, does a function, a Fahrenheit function exist in libraries that we already know is tested? Mm. And so we can match it, right? Mm -hmm. That would be another way of that. I don't know why you would write that function to do something that already exists. Yeah, that's a good point though. So we would not, okay, well, we assume that the function doesn't already exist. So basically most of the time mm -hmm. that I'm making some function, I'll just run it myself and see if it works. Um, but the point is, instead of doing it ourselves, we can make it automatic. So now by using PyTest, we can have it look in this file and find all of these test functions and run them all. So basically every time I modify something in this code, it will rerun all these tests. Mm, yes. Yeah, and there's a good comment in HackMD. So there's other things you can check, like does it actually return a number? Well, I guess if it's not a number, it can't do this subtraction here. Is it in an expected range? Things like that. I might set up this where I'm testing several different values of the input and so on. Okay. So next is this preserving expected functionality. So whenever I um, make something new, I run it and I convince myself it works. But the test lets me do that test over and over again so that I'm not just checking once. 
So basically, I can do every test I ever did every time I make any change. This is good. And sort of the same way, so the few pro the projects where I've added tests and then I start modifying stuff, it actually feels really good to go make a change and then run the test and then see, okay, here's all the errors that came out. And then, um, okay, like this is good. Like it, it's actually good for something else to find the errors. So that way I don't have to think about so much about the coding myself. Mm test help users of the code. So basically someone that's installing your code on another system or maybe trying to see does the code even still work with the latest version of Python or Julia or R or whatever, they can see is it still reasonable. It also helps to show the quality of the code. So you're probably a lot more eager to go and use some code that has test than something that doesn't. Yeah, m many of you who, who use uh, software from other people, especially research, are very happy when there is testing because you can trust the author yeah. very often. <laughs> yeah. So test make it easier for people to change your code, including you, as I was saying. And when someone is offering to improve your code, you can say, okay, the test passed, so I only need to look at the code itself. I don't need to try to run it and look for those kinds of errors. And there's this great picture of an old diver getting ready to go on a coding adventure. So tests also help with your code quality itself. So when I'm working on a project, it starts small and it gets larger. And there's some point I say, okay, I need to test. And it forces me to think, okay, is this easy to test? For example, here are Fahrenheit to Celsius functions before is easy to test. You basically just call it. But let's look at this other good code. It uses a global variable to take an input and set some global value. This is harder to test. So you would, um, like testing would move you away from this strategy. And you'll see this in modular code development later today. So testing makes it more modular, more modular makes it easy to test and both make your code quality higher. When would you not add tests? Well, that's... I, I guess there's no right question, uh, no right answer, but yeah. first thing that comes to my mind is when you have a one-liner mm -hmm. and that one-liner is, I don't know, conditional or something like that, yeah. then maybe you don't need to test that precise line, especially if it's really just zero, one. Yeah. 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 To me, like, there's the size and the difficulty of debugging. There's also the chance of failing in a way I see. So if I get an error in code, then that's good. I know something's wrong. What I really don't want is for the code to work and not give an error because that means I'm getting wrong results and don't know it. So the greater the chance of that, the more important the tests are. And also just how important it is. Like if I don't care about the results, then if it's going in my papers, then yeah. And then that, that judgment, is it something that you feel with experience or uh, I sometimes mean, it's difficult to say, what's the probability of something going wrong here? And yes, you yeah. zero. Yeah. I think everybody had this experience, zero probability <laughs> of getting it wrong and then, yeah. and then yeah. you get it wrong. Yeah. There's a good comment in Hackendy. One of my last famous mistakes was to type a sign instead of a cosine in a one-liner function. So, yeah. Yeah. I think you make it, if you have two minutes, I can tell you another one that I made. Oh, sure. Whereas I assume it was an input output problem. And I assumed that the problem couldn't be the output because it was great. And then I just opened the file and never closed it. And that's why it went in a loop, yeah. in a very weird loop. Mm -hmm. And as it was impossible, it was there because the file was being generated, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
There's also a good question, do I need to test the test function? And so on and so on. So once I saw someone that claimed, okay, you need to also test the tests, but I really don't think so. So um, like if both the code and the test are wrong in the same way, too bad for me. But in most of the cases, either one or the other will be wrong. And then I have to figure out which is, is the test wrong, which sometimes happens, or is the code wrong? Mm -hmm. And then if it's really important, I'll have multiple independent tests. Yeah. And especially when you start implementing all levels of testing, yeah. um, you add one, it, it boils down to redundancy. Like how much redundancy do you think mm -hmm. is necessary to be sure that your yeah. test is going well? If you're known for switching plus and minuses very often, then maybe add a third test. I don't know. Yeah. It's up to you yeah. in a way, no? And there's some projects that are pretty famous for tests. Like, for example, reading about the SQLite database, it claims that there's 1,000 times more code dedicated to the testing than to the database itself. So, yeah. Okay, should we go back to the next part? So concepts. And here we will quickly cover the different types of tests there are. And I'll let you admire this picture here of everything in the wrong slots. Maybe this debate about whether tests should be tested. So actually, no, never mind. Let's save time. Okay, so it's better to have tests that run more often than tests which are either never written or never run because they take too long. So yeah, so every commit or push should be tested. Automatically is better than relying on people to test yourself. So doing it on your other service is um, good, like GitHub, as we'll see. Uh, make sure your test is appropriate for the function. If you're doing floating point numbers, you can't compare them exactly, but you need to compare approximately within their numerical tolerance and so on. Code coverage produces a report which says how much of the, um, so when you run your test, how many lines of code were actually run. So if it says 50%, that means your test didn't test half the code. So the first and easiest step is defensive programming, which is basically sort of like the in-code equivalent of test. So as we see here, there's assert that the Kelvin temperature is greater than zero and so on. So yeah, so basically you can validate the inputs and output of your functions every time they're called. Um, and that's a good way to start and easy to add as you are working. So it's a bit the advanced way of putting print statements, right? Yeah. Instead of mm -hmm. having printing out your output mm -hmm. or a piece of the function, you print out errors in cases when yeah, uh, yeah. the function is not supposed to work. Yeah. So in Python, what assert does is there's a expression here. It will take that and if that is true, do nothing. If it's false, raise an assertion error with this message. And you can actually run the Python code and have it ignore all the assertions. If you, if like you want to run it optimized somehow. Okay, unit tests. What do you think of when you hear unit tests? Test of small bits. So if you're building a car, I want to be sure that my wheels are round. I want to be sure that my wind chills are, mm -hmm. you know, wind resistant yeah. or whatever. I'm not an engineer, as if it wasn't <laughs> clear from this answer. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it's like testing every smallest possible piece in isolation, like the Fahrenheit to Celsius test was a unit test. So these are usually easy to write. 
but um and where people start but don't test the whole interaction of things that is integration tests so with integration tests you're basically running bits of code that connect multiple functions together and see does the big picture work like does function a call fahrenheit to celsius with the right number of arguments and stuff like that what's, what's the general rule there because in my mind when i when i integrate different pieces of my function together of my code together i write a function to make them work together so is an integration test basically a unit test for a larger function that is supposed to subtask a lot of stuff yeah i guess so um yeah i mean in my practice i never really think what kind of test it is i just well do what makes sense because my work is usually research type work and it's chaotic okay regression tests are things that are specifically designed to test regressions which means something that used to work is now working differently and you know what the result should be which i guess in some way you could say everything checks that but regression tests are especially designed to compare to the older outputs test driven development is something exciting so the idea here is that instead of writing code and writing a test first you write a test that has the output that you know it should get, and then you write the minimum amount of code to make that pass. Okay, continuous integration we will see after the break. That is basically something that will automatically run the test on every code. We already covered code coverage, which is looking at how many lines have actually been run during the test. And you can even get a report saying what lines work and don't work. Um, yeah, the time to test matters. You've said that. Tests can have their own bugs. Yeah, we've been talking about that. And testing frameworks can make this easy. So we're going to see PyTest. So it pr provides a lot of the things we need above, like minimum output, running quickly, selecting individual tests to run, um, debugging when tests go wrong, and so on. And I guess we've already talked about most of these good practices here. Maybe we can especially emphasize this. Don't deactivate things immediately. That's a very slippery slope to no more tests. Testing the errors, like if a function is supposed to give an error, you can make sure it actually does. And make it easy to run the test with, say, a single command. So with that, should we get to the exercise? Let's see. Yeah. OK. Let's go on. So testing locally. So how much of this was type along and how much was exercise actually? It's supposed to be mostly exercises. So PyTest. So PyTest is one of the most common unit testing frameworks in Python these days. So we're going to make some simple functions and use PyTest. Um, well, I mean, the whole example is basically here. So do we have any introduction to give? Or should we oh, send you I, straight to it? I think we should send them straight. Like The introduction was the last two chapters. Yeah, <laughs> OK. So what will happen here? You will make a new directory for the tests. You will add your code in there, which is this part. You will then use PyTest to 
run it. And then you'll practice breaking the test and seeing how PyTest behaves then. And then there's an extra thing. So, okay, to the exercise. Uh, you will have 15 minutes for this, I believe. Well, we'll write it in the hack and D. So, see you then. Bye. Hello, we're back. It seems. Um, so, this exercise was not very hard. Um, but there's some good questions here. So, this question number 11 was quite good. What's the purpose of the exercise? So, from my understanding, PyTest helps to find syntax errors in codes, but that's something that other things do. So, the point isn't to find syntax errors, it's to find these logic errors. Like, find something where the function actually runs properly and doesn't give an error, but the results are wrong. And for that, you have to actually look at the output and not rely on the language compiler to say there's some error or some exception. The point about writing code in nano seems unnatural is true. But, I mean, we, we recommend nano here only because that's sort of the lowest common, um, like that's something that we know will work on every operating system the same. In practice, you'll be writing these tests in whatever other editor you're using. Okay, um, should we look at the example Matteo has done? Can I go to your screen? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so here we see the function. Yeah, so I'm on the optional uh, local to exercise. Yeah, of course. So there's this add is the and test code. So how can we trivially break this function to show that there's something wrong? I, I mean, we very... Oops, what sorry, if we do a minus b, for example? Okay. So this would probably break it, right? So we yeah. can try it. So now we run PyTest. Yeah. And we see the error. So the function ran correctly. It just gave the wrong results. And if we were using these results in something else, then um, we wouldn't actually know there was a problem. So PyTest provides this extra stuff. So notice this whole thing in red and green and blue here. So it shows the uh, the error and it shows what the assertion is and it adds in these extra lines. Like it says where the left side is minus 0 0.1 and the right side is, no, it says where minus 0 0.1 is the result of this add function. So yeah. So can you run PyTest with the dash dash PDB option also? Uh, instead of B or uh, in addition? In addition. Like this? Yeah. P PDB, you said. Yes, yeah. So this starts the Python debugger. And now can you type add, like basically add uh, 0 0.1 comma 0 0.2? Okay, hmm, this looked wrong. Let's try something else. Let's add uh, 0 0.1 and 0 0.5. Okay, now I think I see what the problem is. I know there's something wrong in this function. So let's do exit to exit the debugger. And it just command exit, great. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So these kind of things help us to, um, yeah, to run these tests automatically and quickly. Okay. Oops. 
it's time for the break, so let's go there. Yeah, we can keep answering the questions there. So see you in 10 minutes. Bye. Hello, we are back and hopefully everyone can hear us now. Let's see, there's some interesting questions here. Actually, a little bit in a little bit, we'll talk about test design and go over some of these, like, um, like this question, how do you do test when input and output are more complex, like pandas data frame numpy.ra? I mean, really, it's the same idea. So you make the test function and you provide it the more complex data and you'd have slightly more complex um, verifications to see that it works correctly. Uh, similarly up here, working with a code, say like a live database or something like that. So most of my projects, I distribute some small sample data with them that's either artificially generated or real data from something. And then I can run the test functions on that and test the reading, the um, running, and all that kind of stuff. Let's see. There's a good question about when testing the floating point numbers. Do you pick some arbitrary number or do you use the pytest.approx function? And you can read this documentation on approx and it actually goes through a lot of the different considerations when doing numerical tests. Okay, let's go on. So automated testing. So now I will go to Matteo's screen, right? Okay, here we are. Okay. Um, we are so. going to automated testing now. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of, well, you can do this as a type along or you can do it as a demo. We will try to go slow enough that you can type along. So we did PyTest on our own computer. Now we're going to do it on GitHub. So we set up a repository, we have the code, we have the test, and we'll configure GitHub to run it. So I've got HackMD open looking at questions, so let's begin. So exercise CI1, create a repository on GitHub or GitLab. Um, yeah. Uh, should I maybe follow here? Or do, do I wanna or, give Or yeah, actually, yeah, you're right. We're going, yeah, okay. Well, well, yeah, okay, let's go through the summary. So we create the repository, we add some code to it, and we set up the tests with GitHub. We find the bug in our repository and we open the issue. We'll fix the bug and then we will um, merge the fix. Okay, let's begin. So create a new repository on GitHub. So yeah. the lesson suggests we call it example-ci. Like this. Yeah. We don't need any description or that other no stuff. Readme. No readme, yeah. Now we just create. create. OK. And now it tells us how to clone it. But do you need to do the SSH cloning? Uh, no, I just need to. Because we'll need to push back to here, so. Aha, uh -huh. OK. Um... OK. Hmm. Did you move huh. your SSH stuff away to clean up the environment? Ugh, there's a chance. 
but let me because I normally do it with this. Okay. And this should still connect it. And you can push with HTTPS. Yeah. Okay. Mm, and you've cloned an empty repository. Yeah, exactly. Sorry for the Italian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now we change to the example dash CI directory. Check, it's perfect. Okay. Um, and we try just a push just to be sure. Mm. Um, I guess, is there no, nothing to push? No, I also said that I don't have it uh, pushed. That's a bit weird. Let's write later when I have yeah. a, a commit. Yeah, okay. let's, let's go on. So now we add this example.py file in there. There is this okay, copy, yeah. Copy here. Oh, well, yeah, of course. Mm. Is it example.py? Example.py, yes. Yeah. OK, so we've got the code pasted there, and we see it has the addition function, some mm -hmm. test add that looks like it probably works. A subtract function which has a bug in it and a test which is commented out so we will save the file save and closed and now we will test it with pytest so pytest example.py okay passed. and it works okay so now we git add the file and git commit. Yep. Okay. And now the test, can you push? Yes. Yes. Okay, so you've got HTTP set up to push somehow. Okay, good. Don't ask me how. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So now we're going to enable automated testing. So we go back to the GitHub interface, although we also have examples for GitLab. And if we click on the actions tab up here, we see some sample workflows. And one includes Python application. This one. And it says create and test a Python application. So yesterday when we did this, we made our own workflow file by adding the file ourselves. Now we are letting GitHub sort of do it automatically. So it automatically precedes this with something. And if we look around here, we see name Python application missions, a bunch of stuff. We see the same on line 21 and 22. Um, it does checkout, it does set up Python with version 3.1, it installs dependencies, which is basically Flake 8 and PyTest. Flake 8 is what we call a linter, so it basically looks at the syntax and sees do you use best practices there. Um, and then at the very bottom, it says PyTest. And we're modifying this to say PyTest example.py. Line 39. <clears throat> uh, we want to modify this to say example.py after PyTest. Oh, uh, wait. Yeah, sorry. So why is this? So if you run PyTest without any arguments, by default, it will look for all the files that begin with test underscore. But here, we want to test something that doesn't match that pattern. So we give the exact name. So what you could do is to write all the tests in a test file. Mm -hmm. And then PyTest would just look at that file in particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to run the test, you wouldn't even need to know what arguments to use or anything. You just mm -hmm. run PyTest. OK, so we to, start. To do, the, to do that, just, just a detail, do you then have to, is the, um, I guess that in the test file, you're going to have to import the library in which you, I mean, the, the, 
the file in which you define all the functions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we click so. start commit. And it offers to, maybe we need to give, well, maybe, can you just commit without a name? It suggests a title of enable automated testing, but it's clearly not needed. Okay, so here we are. It just made a Python app dash YAML in the dot GitHub workflows directory. Can we go back to the root of the repository? So we see this yellow dot here um, in the gray box. Can you mm -hmm. click on that yellow dot? So the checks haven't been completed yet. Okay. Can you click on the Actions tab? Well, okay, the test passed, so we see the green check. Can you mm -hmm. click on there and let's see what's inside? So that we see there's build. If you click on build, it took 11 seconds and it did all these steps. It did set up the job, uh, set up Python, lint, test, and then cleaned everything up. Can you click on test with PyTest? And there's our output. It says one test passed. Okay. Which is the same output that we found here, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Oops. So let's go back to the shell. And we're going to pull the repository. Okay. And now we're going to... Um, open the example.py file. And we're going to uncomment this test. I'd recommend staying in the window here. I could say what to do and people can open. Yeah, okay. Uh, um, not this part. Not that part, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> what just happened? So we're adding a test which is going to fail, so we think. And now you can save the file. Oh, sorry. You said to stay in, right? Oh, no, this is good. Yeah. Or Exit and save. And let's add the file in Git with git add example.py. Sorry, uh, the U, uh -huh. for those who don't know, the U is just adding the files that are already tracked. Okay. Yeah. So basically look for everything that's Git. That I already com um that has been added sometime in the past, but has not, but it's changed. Okay, and should we commit with some message? Okay. And then let's push it. And push. And now we go back to GitHub and let's click on that actions view again. Okay, there's another one, and we see the yellow dot. This also exists on the code view and beside every single commit. So when I see it here. Uh-huh. Still completing the checks, right? Yep. And wait, let me actually. Aha, uh -huh. and now it's red. So let's click there and examine the situation. So we see the red X everywhere. And if we click on things. Uh, for example here. Yeah, so it's red and it's opened up and we see it says process completed with error code one and it shows the PyTest error message. Okay, so what do we do? So the exercise suggests we open an issue. So let's go to the issue tab here. And we click new issue. And let's call it subtract test is broken. 
and we would normally give a longer description, but whatever. Okay, and we can submit the issue. Now we fixed a broken test in a pull request. So we can go back to the terminal. Okay, can we repeat the last step? So is this the issue, creating the issue? Um, so we clicked on the issue tab up here. If you can click there again. And then new issue over here. But this part is actually not essential to what we're doing. So you won't have an issue number to close, but that's OK. Can we go back to the terminal? OK. So now we make a new branch. So we can call it uh, your name dash bug fix. So we do it with checkout dash B. Uh... Okay, dash fix bug. Yeah. Oh, sorry. What was the? <laughs> well, this is good. Fix bug, bug fix, whatever. People can adapt. Okay, so now we're on this new branch. So let's fix it. So let's open example.py. And what do we Aha. fix? Subtract. There is a mistake here. So right? we make it minus. And is this the right way? So a minus b, two minus three should be minus one. Yeah, I guess this is probably right. But anyway, GitHub will verify. So we save and quit. Should, should we try a, a fake thing to see if the verification is going to be right? <laughs> mm. no, okay, that's right. maybe that's... some of you, if you want, you can try to fix it in the wrong way and see what happens. But for the sake of time, Let's fix it the right way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we commit, which is on the new branch, not on the default branch. Of course, I encourage you to have better comments than the ones that I'm inventing now. <laughs> yeah. And then. Okay, and now uh, we push, yes. and we I need to, to tell first. it push. So this is telling it that this branch will be pushed to origin. Yeah, OK. So let's go to GitHub. So back to the web browser. Can you zoom in a little bit? Yes. Is there enough? Uh, maybe more? more. Hopefully it works in the mobile mode. So we go to. Can you click on the code view? Look, and GitHub is notifying us. Mateo Fixbug has recent pushes one minute ago. Do you want to make a pull request? Should we try? OK, so let's do it. Let's click compare. And can we show our last command again? Someone asked. Uh, which the last, last command, command where? Uh, I'm, maybe push. I'm going to guess this, this one. Yeah. Yeah, this is necessary because you open a new branch, but GitHub doesn't know that you have a new branch. So when you try to commit and then push, it's going to try to push to the main, but it recognizes that it comes from something that doesn't exist on GitHub yet. Yeah. So you have to be very clear that first you push the the, the new the new branch on which yeah. you're working. So the set upstream wasn't essential here. If you didn't have that, you would have to say origin Mateo bug fix every time. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. So back yeah, to this the is button. done in such a way that every time you push git push from the branch, it pushes it to the GitHub. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so back to the said. back to the web browser. So we click compare and pull request. So we see if we look here at the pull request, we can remember what we did a week ago. So we're make a pull request from Mateo fixbug to main. 
and we can adjust those if needed, but we don't need to. So we do attempt at fixing bug. Yeah, so it, it took the message from the commit, so that's reasonable. Uh, so, but let's modify this. So let's modify the title to be this, but then we add at the end comma, closes number one. So number one was that issue we made that says there's a bug. So we actually could have done this in the commit title itself, but I forgot to mention that. Uh -huh, yeah. So, okay, good. So I guess we are ready to create the pull request. At this point, we still don't know whether the test passed, right? We, right. we assume because I guess we tested it locally, which we didn't, but. Mm, yeah, we didn't, okay. But notice here, it says some checks haven't completed, so it's yellow. So we will wait a few minutes for this to run. Oh, it all says all checks. Passed. Okay, good. So to remind ourselves, we can click on the files changed view up here. And it's the change is a plus to a minus. Okay, it looks reasonable. If we go to the checks view, we can see the things that ran. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we can go back to the conversation view. The conversation view. That's the main. Uh, there is someone asking, so no tests are done on the branch push. Uh, you can, yeah. of course. Yeah. Uh, we didn't. We just assumed GitHub was going to make, make them. Yeah. I mean, we really should have run the test before pushing it. <laughs> well, I mean, in this yeah. case, I probably wouldn't have run the test and hoped I got it right and relied on GitHub. But if there was any question, mm -hmm. then um, I would run it myself. Okay. So if we scroll down we can accept the issue and click merge pull request. Merge pull request, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. And confirm merge. Okay. And we can click delete branch if we want to keep our stuff clean. And let's go back to the code view, which is there. So now we're on the repository view. And notice there's another yellow dot here. So we're waiting for this to work. So it basically runs the test two times. Yeah, so like it ran it once when it was before it was merged and now it's running after it's merged. Because now this is a new commit that's basically been pushed. The merge is a new merge commit. Mm -hmm. And what do you know? We're basically right on time. Yeah. And by the way, the, the merge let's, tested positive. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I don't know if you noticed so before, let's... by the way, this is pretty useful. When we ran the first test on the branch, a little green check came out on the, uh, uh, yeah. here, which is very nice. If you're doing something else, all of a sudden you see your notification in your, in your tabs. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So where do we go from here if we go back to the bottom of the lesson? So we're scrolling down. Oh, yeah. So this used Python, but as you can probably guess, GitHub Actions can be used with many different languages. Same with GitLab Actions or pipelines and other things. Uh, for basically whatever you need to do, you can do a web search and then you can see, um, like find, find the example to copy to set it up. This workflow works both with centralized and forking workflows or even for your own project. So it's nice to be able to, well, I mean, maybe this is not what the purist would say to do, but you know, I make commits and I push it 
and I wait for an email from GitHub and GitHub might say, oh, it failed. Okay, well, I just broke my repository, but if I'm the only one using the repository, I'm willing to accept that for myself. Um, but when you have these pull requests, then you can tell if it will break before you merge it. So the repository's main branch is always working. You can find a wide variety of other things like this in the marketplace for GitHub Actions and, well, similarly, examples of GitLab and so on. Yeah. I'm going to go to the HackMD and let's see what questions we may have had there. Yeah. And an addition, of course, is that here I've been working with Vim uh, without using any IDE in particular, but mm -hmm. uh, PyCharm and VS Studio, among others, definitely yeah. help you with testing. Mm -hmm. I think that this is such a uh, this is such an important thing that every good IDE has a way to test. Um, um, automatically basically yeah 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 so it's not actually actually like most people what they do it will be more streamlined than this as part of the ide yeah. but if we're doing it in id in this example then we're, we end up teaching the ide which not exactly. everyone uses so our test done when the branch is pushed so we see the definition in the file. It says it only does pushes to the main branch and pull requests to the main branch. And are the tests on GitHub quite slow? So it can take a little while for them to start up, but once they're running, they don't run much slower than your own computer. Um, but yeah, like this is not what you'd usually use for development. So you'd be running on your own computer. And if you have some project where the tests are really, truly massive, then maybe you'd start looking for other places to run these. Mm. Would it make more sense to test locally? Well, I mean, if you remember to run locally, then I guess that works okay. But personally, I don't remember. So I have GitHub remind me. Okay, so we have 15 to 20 minutes before the next break. Should we go to the next part, which is uh, test design? Test design. Yeah. So I will go back to my screen, I guess. Yes. Down here, test design opening. So this we discuss some of these questions you've been asking about like how do you make a test for progressively more complex um, types of functions and behavior so this is basically set up as only exercises so so in other examples we've given 35 minutes for this but well, we don't have that much time. So um, if you look down below, you see different language specific instructions. There is a request for Scala instructions. If you would like to help contribute those, please do. So yeah, I'd say let's just let people work on this immediately. We will come back in 10 minutes and begin discussing based on the questions in HackMD. So please add discussion points there. So you're not going to have enough time to do all of the exercises here. No way. But you know, scroll down and see what looks best to you. So do you want to look at the basic ones about the different types of functions? Do you want to do something that does input and output, um, other dependencies, classes, test-driven development, randomness. It's up to you. So, yeah, 
So please ask questions in HackMD, make your proposals in HackMD. We will look when we get back. Okay, bye. Hello, we're back. So now we've got a few minutes to wrap up. So let's check the HackMD discussion. Um, Matteo, what do you recommend we talk about? So um, there is a question about design eight uh, that has an answer, but I wonder if it's the correct answer because it's an interpretive answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not sure who wrote this exercise initially. Um, and I wrote that answer there, so who knows ah, okay. what. But yeah, but I think this is a good point. So here there's a program that takes some input and gives some output. And we provided a, um, actually I can show it here, design eight. So you're provided with some input file and when you run it, it should make this output file. So when making your test, you can have a collection like input one, output one, input two, output two. So your test is basically making a loop over all of the inputs and checking is it exactly equal to the output. And that's easy because in this case, the output should be deterministic because it will simply remove duplicate lines. But this idea could be usable by other types of problems also. Okay, what else should we look at next? Yeah, that is this question 30, which is I think a question that many people are wondering about. With these test functions, don't you have the risk that you might not find a good anti-example and then the test itself mm, fails? There's still a bug. Yeah. 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 Still writing the well, question, but um, Oh, I guess that depends on how much effort you want to put into it. So, I mean, I'm not sending rovers to Mars, so my tests are designed to help me write things faster, but not designed to protect 100 million euros of investment. So I accept that trade-off. And the more and more important your code is, the more effort that will go into here. You'll have multiple people looking at tests, maybe a completely different person writing the tests, maybe multiple tests from different aspects, like you write one test in one way and another test in another way. You know, actually when I've been writing some particularly interesting algorithms, what I would do is I would write the algorithm in a simple but slow way, and then the fast way I intend to use. And part of my tests are comparing that these two give the same output in addition to whatever other tests I do. And I found that this was easier than trying to debug and do the fast output correct myself. And then I could basically feed in different exam interesting example cases or even random data into the algorithm and see if the example came out the same. This number 29 is really interesting, monkey patch. So this is one of the many things that we haven't even been able to cover here. So if I go back to my screen and I will scroll up to, hmm, which one is the monkey patch one? Number four. Number four, okay, yeah. So, Where's the function itself? Here we go. So check reactor temperature. So there's this other global value, max temperature. So how do we tell that adjusting max temperature does the right thing for the function? I mean, we can't call check reactor temperature with different arguments for it. So what do we do? So, ah, uh, no, yep, max temperature is in the reactor function. So, okay, that's the idea of monkey patch. So, 
the idea is that you run some test, but before the test, you go and you change the value of some other variable or function before the test, and then you change it back after. So basically what's happening here, this line says on reactor set max temperature to a value of 100. And then when the function is done, you will set it back to whatever it was before. So we can check that check reactor temperature is okay at 99 and 100, but starts failing at 101. But what is monkey patch? That's the initial question. So monkey tech patch is something that PyTest provides. So PyTest has this idea called fixtures where you can give arguments to a function. And when PyTest runs it, it says, okay, monkey patch. Um, I know what a monkey patch is. That's this other thing. So it provides it to the function as an argument automatically. It's basically a PyTest thing. I would say the syntax can't make sense unless you go see more about how PyTest works and then maybe it still doesn't make sense, but at least you understand it and can use it. Okay, back to HackMD. I think the, there was a question uh, that related, actually, no, this is, not, this is not a question, but it relates to the discussion we had before how to test for more complex inputs and outputs. Mm -hmm. And maybe design seven can give a bit an idea of it uh, mm -hmm. where you don't only have you know, complex output with uh, a five roll dice in the same mm -hmm. function with the Yetzi function, but also mm -hmm. you have random mm -hmm. thrown in the mix. Yeah. I don't know if it's the same for others, but for me, random stuff is very interesting to test for. <laughs> yeah. So is there a HackMD question about this with other answers? Was it something... No, not, not really something that I noticed myself. I mean, okay. we, we had some questions before about how to test for more complex yeah. examples, right? And I think it ties, it gives a oh. good example. Maybe you don't have to go through so, the example, but just to notice that yeah. this is there. So let's, let's use this example. So testing a dice simulator. So when you roll the die, how do you test if it's right? Well, if it's six-sided, well, first we assume we can test that it's an integer and it's not zero or less or not seven and more. And then we can do things like p-value test. Like, so we roll say 1000 times and does it meet some distribution? So of course that's sort of difficult because whatever p-value we pick, the test will be failing that often. So you want to think about that some. Um, in one of my previous works, I let's pretend it is a weighted die. So we want to be able to give in some probabilities to it. So say, okay, I want one to have twice the value of the other numbers. But I had this program where I would force these weights to zero or one so it would make a consistent output and could use that to sort of verify that the edge cases were correct. And then in this case, I was confident enough that if the edge cases were correct, the middle was probably correct. But I would like to add another question about this in HackMD. Um, and we can discuss more during the break. And then we come to modular code development. So hopefully this was an exciting episode. The basic moral of the story is tests can make your code more accurate, but also make your development faster because you don't have to think about these things more. And of course, when you're a scientist can make your work faster so you don't have to go redoing stuff because you found a bug, which is not fun. Okay, great. Take a break. We resume at the hour and hack and the discussion. Bye.